Greetings, everyone. Uh, my name is Brady Whitten, and I welcome you to worship here at First United Methodist Church in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I welcome those of you who are here in person and those who are joining us at home. So I don't know how many of you went to a graduation this week. I went to four, uh, two of my own, and then two related to uh, our church here. And here's what I can promise you. I will get you out of here this morning sooner than they did those graduations. <laughs> But as we continue our celebration of Easter, uh, we are going to talk about the Bible and see how through it we can hear a word from God for our lives today. Uh, Will you stand with me and join in our call to worship? Come to Christ, that living stone, rejected by the world, but in God's sight, chosen and precious. We have responded to Christ's call and seek to be built into a spiritual house, a living reminder of God's presence on earth. Once we were no people, but now we are God's people, called out of the darkness and into God's marvelous light. Therefore, we sing with the church in all ages. Join me in the affirmation of faith. This is the good news which we have received, in which we stand, and by which we are saved. Christ died for our sins, was buried, and was raised on the third day, and appeared first to the woman, and then to the Peter, the twelve, and then to the many faithful witnesses. We believe Jesus is the Christ, the anointed one of God, the firstborn of all creation, the firstborn from the dead, in whom all things hold together, in whom the fullness of God was pleased to dwell by the power of the Spirit. Christ is the head of the body, the church, and by the blood of the cross reconciles all things to God. Amen.
uh, and before Kim shares a few more things about our shared life together, I want to share with you that uh, some of you may have been wondering where Reverend Don Cottrell has been. He's really been gone for several months. His daughter, Caitlin, uh, has been battling stage four cancer in Scotland. And I'm sorry to say that she passed away yesterday. And so I just ask that you keep uh, Caitlin, Don, and their whole family in your prayers. This morning, the flowers are given to the glory of God in celebration of the class of 2022. In appreciation of Kel Wedekum and the First United Methodist Church Youth Ministry by the Botter, by the Beecham, the Kane, the Hathaway, the Monroe, the Pettit, the Rodrig, the Schilling, and the Up families. Today's guest musician is provided in celebration of the 56th wedding anniversary of Jay and Carol Little. And this votive candle this morning is in memory of Gary Teal. Join me in prayer. All-knowing and compassionate God, you are a constant presence, guiding, advising, hinting, strengthening us for the journey into discipleship. And yet, our current days is a time of weariness and of endless reports of trauma and change and death. Worn out by such words and events and pain, how easy is it us for, for us to look upon the other, be distracted, and avoid the inward gaze? Our ability to put on a good exterior and, but still have secret struggles, to hold grudges, lust, seek revenge, and carry baggage. Into the silence, we ask and examine ourselves. Are we open, really open, to hearing the ongoing calling of the Spirit in our lives? Thank you for your word, Lord. It reveals, it washes, it renews, it lets us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Give us strength, O oh Lord, and consistency in our walk with you through our word, through your word. Through your spirit, inspire us to change what needs to be changed and to be blessed and encouraged in areas that we need it most. And now hear us as we pray with confidence as our Savior has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The children during this next hymn are invited to come forward during the last verse. And I also invite the children online to gather around for the children's sermon.
I'm so glad that you came to see me this morning. I have a big bag of books, and I was going to see if you could help me out with them this morning. Um, the first book I have, how many of you have ever seen a little book like this? You have, do you know what this is? You've seen something like this. This is a baby Bible. When my oldest son, Tucker, was born, someone from our church came to our house to see Tucker, and they gave him this little baby Bible. So I have, have this one at my house. Then when you're in second grade here at First Methodist, you get a second grade Bible. So we have this one at our house. And then when you're in the youth group, you get another Bible. And this is like a study Bible. This is like a serious Bible. And then, okay, so sometimes when I read the Bible, I don't understand some of the stories or some of the scripture. So I always go to my Jesus storybook Bible. This one's for children. And if I don't, if I read something in here that I don't understand, I go to this one because it's in simple language, and then I understand it a lot. So this is actually my favorite Bible. Then I have a Bible on my phone. Can you believe that? I, I know. It's crazy. And then my, this is my other favorite Bible. So um, this is not actually my grandmother's Bible, but when I was little, I would go to North Carolina to visit her, and she had this black leather Bible that was really worn and it was falling apart and it was kind of a mess. It had sticky notes everywhere and like paper sticking out of it. And I was like, Grandma, w what is this? And she'd be like, well, the sticky notes tell me where my favorite um, verses are. And then she said, when like my friends would write me a note or if I saw something in our church bulletin that I like, she was like, I would just shove that in my Bible too, so that when I would read my favorite scripture, I could also be reminded of my special notes or my prayers. So we're going to be talking about the Bible this morning. The Bible was written a long, long time ago, and it was written by different people, and it wasn't written all at one time. And in the Bible, you'll find stories about, like, um, Adam and Eve, Abraham and Sarah, you might find um, some rules like the Ten Commandments. There's poetry like the Psalms. There's letters. But I was on my way to church this morning and I was listening to a radio um, station and the man said that one of our presidents, Ronald Reagan, said that you will find all the answers that you need to know between the covers of the Bible. And I was like, wow. So I wrote that down because I thought that was really important. So just think about that. As you get older, you're probably going to collect a lot of Bibles, but everything you need to know, all the answers to any questions you have, you can find between the front cover and the back cover of the Bible. So before we go back to our seats, I thought we would um, close with our prayer, and we're actually going to, I'm going to use a, a verse from the Bible. So let's put our hands together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Amen. So as the children return to their seats, I want to invite you all to stand and take a moment and to share the peace of Christ with one another. And I invite those of you who are at home to do the same uh, with those you're worshiping with or in the comments on, the, on whichever platform you're on.
So I hope you always take a little bit of time and read through your bulletin when you're here on Sunday mornings. And for those of you who are at home, uh, you'll find many announcements in the comments on whichever platform you're worshiping on. But uh, this, will, this will keep you informed about a lot of things happening in the life of our church. Uh, I want to lift a couple of things to your attention, really some transitions that are coming that you need to be aware of. And uh, as I do, I do want to invite you to take a moment to find the attendance pad that is at the end of each pew. And inside that attendance pad, you'll find a connect card. And that's just the way that you can let us know that you're in worship. And we do ask you, you take a moment and just uh, fill those out. If you could tear one of those out uh, and then put it in the offering plate when it comes by, that would also be helpful. If you're visiting with us, I would do want to offer you a special welcome. We're really glad that you're here and ask in particular that you take a moment and fill out one of those Connect cards. We just want to be able to say welcome. And uh, for those of you at home, you'll find a Connect card link online. So uh, many of you know in the United Methodist Church that uh, we are an itinerant system and people are moved and, and the clergy uh, come and unfortunately they go. And uh, I am uh, going to share a few transitions happening with you this morning about our clergy staff and some other staff. So the first thing I want to let you know is that the Reverend Greg Tony. Uh, has decided it is time for him to retire. Uh, what's really happening is he and Kelly are moving to, to be in Texas near their grand, gr- new grandbaby. And so I know many of you can understand that. And so uh, Greg will be transitioning from our pastoral staff at the end of June. Uh, I am in conversation with our superintendent about uh, getting some other clergy on our staff, but uh, just We'll, we'll keep you informed about that when I find out more information about that. Uh, other thing we want to make sure you know is that uh, Dottie Anklam, who has been the administrative assistant to our care and senior adult ministry, has also decided to retire, and she will be uh, retiring at the end of June as well. Uh, and then the final one I need to let you know about is that uh, Dr. Dick Webb will be transitioning to the position of organist, organist emeritus in the life of his church, our church, and so he will no longer be having, no longer have Sunday morning playing responsibilities, but Dick wants to make sure you all know that he is not hanging up his organ shoes. <laughs> uh, So you will, you will still see him around. He's, he'll still be teaching at LSU. He'll still be playing around the country as he normally does. And uh, what, I, what I really am telling you all this for, so you'll know that, but also we will be having a uh, celebration reception for these folks on Sunday, June the 19th. Uh, and so we'll have cake and punch, and we'll give you all a chance to say uh, your, your goodbyes and thank yous to them at that time. But just wanted to let you know about that. And again, uh, I'll be in communication with you uh, and our SPR chair, uh, our SPR committee, that's our staff parish relations committee, uh, will be communicating with you all about who will be coming on our staff. Uh, and with those things said, I'll invite our ushers to come forward as we take up our offering this morning. And as they come, I invite you to bow your heads with me in prayer. Lord God, if we take a moment to reflect where all of our blessings come from, we know that they come from you. And so we offer our lives and the fruit of our labors to you uh, that we may proclaim the life and love of Jesus Christ in this world. And so we ask your blessing upon this offering and all the good that it does through the life of this church. And it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.
join me in the prayer of illumination, which is printed in your bulletin. Let us pray. Risen Christ, for whom no door is locked, no entrance barred, open the doors of our hearts and speak to us now through your holy word. In your name we pray. Amen. Today's reading is from the book of Hebrews. Indeed, the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides soul from spirit, joints from marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And before him no creature is hidden, but all are naked and laid bare to the eyes of the one to whom we must render an account. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to So in this season of graduations, uh, by the way, you all know my, I had a, my oldest child graduated from high school this week. I think I'm still processing that, but that was exciting for us this week. But in this season of graduations, um, I had another graduation in the life of the church, and that is that uh, I concluded teaching a Disciple One Bible study that had been meeting on Wednesday nights. And for those of you who aren't familiar with Disciple Bible Study, it is a 34-week long intensive survey of the Bible, and by the time you're done with it, you've read somewhere around 80% of the whole, whole Bible. Um, and uh, going through this with this group of people once again, and one of the things you do as the last part of the class is sort of share what it's meant to you. And so uh, hearing from this class, I was just reminded once again how powerful and life-changing studying the Scriptures can be. So one class member shared this with me. She said, I sit here watching the final video for our class, and I can't help but think back on the last 34 weeks and where I was at the beginning of this study. I cannot put into words everything I've learned and now understand. She said, growing up, I never studied the Bible, so this was a new experience for me. And because of you and this class, I now have a much closer and better relationship with God and with Jesus. And that's what you heard from a lot of these class members about what this experience of really diving into the Scriptures was like. So while I was thinking about this this week, I decided that I would, I would preach a sermon on the Scriptures. And I will tell you that uh, I have had an experience where I have really encountered what we would call the Word of God in Scriptures. God, the, God has sort of spoken to me and leapt off the pages to me through the Scriptures. Uh, the writer of Hebrews tells us that the Word of God is living and active. And again, I've, I've, I've had that experience myself. But, but I also want to tell you, I have also experienced times where the Bible has been very frustrating and very silent. Um, and so today, what I really want to do is sort of share a few things with you that I've learned about reading the Scriptures that I hope will help you to have that living and active encounter with the Word of God. And I'm going to share four things which breaks every rule about preaching and public speaking, because you're always supposed to do what? You're supposed to do three. Threes just work really well, but this one's four, so just be ready. So the, the first thing I want to say, first thing I've learned is this, include good teachers and companions, okay? If you want, if you want the Bible really to speak to you and, and become living and active, include good teachers and companions. So we have this idea that we can just sort of open up the Bible and get it right away. And I hear people say stuff like that all the time, well, just read the Bible, um, that somehow the Bible is a simple book that has a simple story. Uh, but the truth is, if you really dig into it, there is nothing simple about the good book. Uh, it can be very complex. It can be, you know, very confounding at times. And part of this is that the Bible is not just one book. Even though we have it sort of bound in this, in this one thing, it's really not just one book. It is, in fact, anybody know how many? 66 separate writings. Uh, written by different authors, it was written in different languages, is, it was written in different cultural contexts, and, and over a period of 2,000 years, this book sort of came together, right? Uh, the Bible also does not just contain one kind of writing. Uh, it's not like opening a John Grisham novel where you just go from start to finish and it's all the same. Uh, it has theology, which is teachings about God. It has poetry. It has law. It has history. There are wisdom writings, and there, there are even more kinds than that. And because of its complexity, I think we all need good teachers to help us really begin to dive in and understand the Scriptures. 
Uh, so when I attended seminary, it was such a blessing for me to be able to uh, learn from people who just knew way more than I did about the Bible. I had a, a, a New Testament professor who would stand, and he would read from the Greek, translating as he went along. And it was just, here, here was a guy who knew about the biblical languages in a way that, I mean, I can read at Greek, but, but I don't read Greek, right? Um, I also really appreciated the discussions we would have with the group of people, and people would share their questions and share their insights, and, and somehow the Bible came alive through those, those moments of learning and conversation. I think one of the biggest mistakes we can make with the Bible is taking it into a room all by ourselves and reading it in an isolated way, uh, reading it away from, uh, you know, teachings, reading it away from conversation. In many ways, the Bible was designed to be a community book. Think about it. How many places do you go where, we, where, where somebody stands up in community and reads from what? A book. I mean, it doesn't happen that much anymore, but part of our worship is we stand up, we read from this book. It's, it's our book. It's a community book. Uh, but, of course, my learning did not end at seminary. After seminary, I have continued to learn, and one of the primary ways I've done that is by reading, uh, you know, good teachers and things that they've written about the Bible. And I'll, I'll tell you a few, few people that I really have taught me a lot. <laughs> this will not surprise anybody. Dallas Willard. I mean, if you've heard me teach or preach, love Dallas Willard. Um, Adam Hamilton has been really helpful to me. He's got a great book called Making Sense of the Bible, uh, where he breaks down some of the very simple things and simple uh, questions that people have. Uh, James Bryan Smith has been hugely helpful to me. A woman named uh, Barbara Brown Taylor, a writer named N.T. Wright. Uh, so in our church, the most comprehensive study of the Bible that we have is the disciple Bible study curriculum. And there's disciple one, there's disciple two, disciple three, disciple four. Uh, we are always starting new disciples, typically in the fall. So we'll start some in August, and then we usually start some in January as well. So I want you to begin to think and pray about, hey, when, when the summer's over and we've done our beach vacations and we've taken our breath, maybe in August I'll, I'll, I'll commit myself to one of these long-term studies. So I, kept, I keep saying the word uh, that you should involve good teachers in your study of the Bible. Now, how do you think you know what the good ones are, the good teachers? Uh, I'm going to answer that question in a little bit, but I want you to think about it. But if you want to experience the Bible as the living and active Word of God that speaks into your life, I would encourage you inc include good teachers and companions. So be part of a group uh, that studies the Bible. The second thing I would encourage you to do, th do th is this. Ask your questions. Ask your questions. So Dr. Peter Enns, who is one of the presenters in Disciple Bible Study, says this. Many Christians have been taught that the Bible is truth downloaded from heaven, God's rule book, or a heavenly instruction manual, and that if we follow its directions, out pops a true believer. But if you deviate from that script, God will come crashing down upon you with full force, right? Any of you ever kind of have that sense of the Bible? I was raised, and, and, and many people in the church that I grew up in kind of gave this impression that to ask questions was in some way to be unfaithful, that to be a faithful person was just to accept everything kind of at face value and, and don't ask questions, right? Uh, but the truth is the Bible itself is full of stories of people who question God. I mean, it's, it's all over the place in the Scriptures. Uh, in Genesis 32, we even read about a guy named Jacob. This is one of my all-time favorite Bible stories. Jacob, who actually wrestles with God. And one of the reasons I love that story is that I have typically been a person who has, who has wrestled with God for whatever reason. But after wrestling with God, and by the way, do you know who wins? God. God wins. So you know, Jacob, <laughs> Jacob goes away with a limp. But after his wrestling match with God, Jacob is given a new name. Do you know, what, you know what Jacob's name, the name is given? The name is given Israel, right, which is then given to the nation of Israel. But do you know what the name Israel means? He who wrestles with God. And so in many ways, the Bible is a story about a people who do what? Who wrestle with God. And that's what we're invited into. We're in, at least that's what I think. We're invited into this relationship with God where we question God and we interrogate God and we ask God because we believe that we have a God who will answer us back and will meet us. We don't, we don't have a God who's going to sit silently by while we, while we ask questions. Uh, one of the biggest breakthroughs that I had in my relationship with the Bible and with God came when I realized even though I was hiding my questions from other people, because I thought I don't want to be unfaithful, uh, that God knew my questions. And, and there was something just hit me at one point in time, and I realized, 
wait a minute, God knows that I have these questions. So what if I say them out loud? What if I named the questions? And what began to happen as I dialogued with teachers and dialogued with other people about my questions is my relationship with God grew and it got richer, right? Uh, Now, I do want to offer us a caution about this. There is a type of questioning that seeks to discredit and deconstruct. It's just about tearing things apart. You all know what I'm talking about? And I confess, I did that for a time when it came to the Scriptures and it came to God. And I will just tell you, in personal experience, it's a dead end. As you would expect, tearing something down and just discrediting it is a dead end. Uh, I would also add, I've been in churches before where it kind of seems like that's what the church is about, or Sunday school classes where, like, that's where it's about discrediting the Bible or something like that. Don't do that. It's not helpful. <laughs> so St. Augustine coined a, a phrase in Latin. It's fides querens intellectum, and what it means is faith-seeking understanding. That's what we're after. We're not, we're not questioning the Bible to tear it down. Uh, we're seeking understanding, right? And this is, this is kind of what we're going for. But I'll just say this, if we're going to fully and honestly engage the Scriptures, and if the Scriptures are going to come alive to us and speak to us in some way, we have to come honestly with our questions. I just think we do. Jesus tells us in Matthew 7, 7, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. So the third thing I found, and this one's been hugely helpful to me, is this. Look for the good news. Look for the good news. So the Gospels tell us that Jesus went about the countryside proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. And I would encourage you, I use this uh, website called BibleGateway.com. Go type in the words good news into BibleGateway.com and see how many times that that phrase is used in the New Testament. Good news, good news, good news. When he sends the disciples out, he tells them to go out and proclaim what? The good news. And I will just say one of my pet peeves in churches is when when we somehow twist the good news of the gospel into bad news. Like, I just, I don't know how we managed to do that, but a lot of us seem to manage to do that. Um, This is one of the most important lenses that I use when reading the scriptures, and it's been hugely helpful to me. I say, where is the good news here? Where is the good news here? And especially with some of the most difficult passages, I ask that question. So one of the things I struggle with and I've long struggled with is are are the violent images of God that are in the Scriptures. Y'all ever, do you struggle with those? And I think one of the reasons is because I grew up knowing Jesus. I grew up knowing that God is love and that we're supposed to love our enemies and that we're supposed to, you know, pray for those who persecute us. That's the Christ that I know. So when I encounter these violent images of God in the Bible, I, I confess that I struggle. I'll never forget the time when I was reading uh, some Bible stories to Zoe, and she was, this was like pre-kindergarten, so she was a toddler, and I was reading out of one of those children's Bibles, <laughs> and there was the story of Noah there, and I read the story of Noah, and Zoe stopped me, and she said, Daddy, why did God kill all the people? And I thought, what I wanted to say is, no, no, sweetie, you're supposed to be paying attention to the cute animals and to the rainbows and to the, you know. But I will also tell you, I was glad that she asked that question. Because it showed me she was fully engaged in the text. She was really listening to it. (laughs) And I don't know that I had an answer at that point in time for why did God kill all the people? So, uh, So anyway, so why did God send the plagues upon the Egyptians? Why did God command the Israelites to destroy the Canaanites? Why did Jesus die such a horrible death? What's the point of all of these stories? Where is the good news? That's, again, if I go with my lens, right? So here's a brief answer because this isn't the point of this sermon. See, in these stories, we uncover, God has revealed to us, first of all, who cares about right and wrong. God cares about what's right and wrong. Uh, We also have a God, it's revealed to us, who is on the side of good. Uh, We have a God who stands up to the powerful on behalf of the oppressed and the marginalized. Uh, We have a God that will go to any length to show us the depth of God's love. I mean, those are just some of the answers. But here's how I really got it. So I I told you all I compared the book of Revelation to Star Wars last week. If if you didn't get to see that sermon, go listen to it. You'll know what I'm talking about. But I'm a huge Star Wars fan. I'm a Tolkien fan. I like Lord of the Rings. Uh, I even got into Game of Thrones a little bit and all this kind of stuff. And what I realized is people have always loved these great stories of good versus evil. We've always loved them. People back then loved them too. And what is it we particularly love about them? that the good guys win, right? And, and uh, if there's any of you out there who like it when the bad guys win, come talk to me. There's something wrong with you. 
Okay, but anyway, so we love these stories because the good guys win. I even like a good old Liam Neeson uh, movie, even though they are the same over and over and over and over again. But the point is the good guys win, right? We love these stories. That's what these stories from the, the scriptures are trying to remind us of and tell us of and call it, the, that God wins, love wins. That's the good news in those stories. So a few weeks ago in this Bible study, I was teaching us on the book of Revelation, and one of the group members said, if anyone can find the silver lining in this book, Brady will. Uh, and I will tell you that I considered that the highest compliment. So I would just encourage you to, when you're reading the Bible, look for the good news. And it doesn't mean there isn't difficult news sometimes, but the difficult news is always pulling us towards which news? The good news. All right, final thing. Seek, this may be a little convoluted, but listen to this. Seek the Word of God in the words of God. Seek the Word of God in the words of God. So when the writer of Hebrews wrote, the Word of God is living and active, he wasn't speaking about the Bible alone, okay? Uh, The Bible, as we know, it didn't exist when the book of Hebrews was written. So when he was saying the Word of God is living and active, he wasn't just talking about the Bible. Uh, And as we read through the Scriptures, what we'll see is that the Word of God or the Word of the Lord is not just a written word. It comes in many different ways. In Genesis 15, 1, we read that the Word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. That was how the Word came to him. Uh, We read that Jeremiah and Isaiah and many of the other prophets, when the Word of the Lord came to them, it often came in the form of a voice, like they heard God speaking. It It wasn't written on the page. Uh, I think that the word of the Lord can come to you through the songs of beautiful hymns and, and, and choir anthems. And I love that your grandmother stuffed all that stuff in her Bible, you know, the things, notes from the bulletins. And I mean, God speaks to us in, in lots of different ways. So all of those little things uh, stuck in Sherry's Bible could be the word of the Lord. The New Testament tells us that it is Jesus himself who is the word of the Lord. Uh, John 1, 1 and 14 says this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and lived among us. So the purpose of a word is to communicate something. Right now, I am communicating to you using what? Words. And I'm taking these ideas and feelings and things that are swirling around in my mind, and I'm communicating them to you. How? In a word. And so when the Bible uses the phrase, the Word of the Lord, what it's trying to say is, God's trying to tell us something. And what are all of the ways that God tries to communicate with us, right? In every way that God can. The natural world can give us a word from the Lord, right? The heavens are declaring the glory of God, the psalmist tells us. So all of these different ways we hear the word with, of course, the understanding as Christians that Jesus is the ultimate communication from God. If you want to know who God is, if you want to know God's mind, you want to know God's will, you want to know God's heart, there's one place and one place only to look. It's who? At Jesus, that's what we believe. So I would change the Ronald Reagan thing a little bit, by the way. So I don't know that, I don't think you can find all the answers that you're looking for in the Bible. I don't. You know what I believe? I believe you can find the one who will give you all of your answers in the Bible. You'll find that one. Um, Now, sometimes when the Word of God comes to us, it comes to us as individuals, right? I think, have we all had that experience where we've opened the pages of the Scripture, and God has spoken to us in some way. Uh, I asked a few people once when they had encountered God in Scripture, and somebody shared this with me. I was traveling for my job to a place where I knew no one, and during a time when I was experiencing many panic attacks, I was in my room before the first meeting, and I felt the onset of an attack when I had a strong desire to open the Scriptures, and I did. And Psalm 139 was before me. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. And this person told me, as I read those words, I felt as though God were speaking directly to me, and it calmed my spirit. Right? So the Scriptures do speak to us in that way. But the Word of God, I really do believe this. I think it's a mistake for us if we take this book and we kind of take it into our closets, and that's the only thing we do with it. It also speaks a word to us about our life together and how God wants us to be together. So some of you probably know the name Clarence Jordan. Uh, in 1942, he started a peanut farm in Georgia, and his intention was to run it the way that he thought Jesus would run it. And now, a lot of famous things came out of this Quenya Farms in Georgia. One of them was Habitat for Humanity. 
uh, Millard Fuller was associated with this, this farm. Uh, but anyway, so Jordan believed that he should take care of the land and that he should take care of the people who worked the land with him. And one of the things he believed the Scriptures told us is that people should get a fair day's wage for a fair day's work. Uh, he also believed that all people, and that included brown-skinned people, white-skinned people, and everything in between, could work and live together. Now, this was the 1950s in Georgia. And he told a story about an ag agricultural student from the University of Florida who came to stay at Koinonia Farm, and this student was from India, and he had very dark skin. And this student from India said he'd never been to a Christian worship service before, and he wanted to know if, uh, if Clarence Jordan would take him, and he said, sure I will. So he found a little local Baptist church, and he took this dark-skinned Indian man with him into that worship service. Uh, and uh, let's just say that the that dark-skinned man in that church caused quite a stir. And after the worship service, if you can imagine this, the pastor drove to Clarence Jordan's house and said, please don't bring any more of those people here to our church. It causes disunity among our people. And about a week later, a group of church members came out to the farm to plead with him to keep these undesirable people out of our church. So uh, Jordan apparently said he would he would consider doing that if he could meet with the congregation and discuss it with them. So they had a gathering, and Clarence Jordan brought with him his Bible. And he said he put the Bible down on the, on the thing, and he says, look, I will agree to stop bringing brown people into this church if you will show me in the Bible where what I've done is wrong. Well, one of the men got up angrily and, and said to Clarence Jordan, he says, don't give me any of that Bible stuff. And Jordan's response I thought was brilliant. He said, I'm not giving you any Bible stuff. What I'm asking for you to do is give that Bible stuff to me. Right? So here's a question. How could a church full of people who read the Bible and hear from the Bible be so far from the will of God that they would not welcome a brown-skinned person into their ranks? How can that happen? How can someone have a mouth full of Scripture but a heart full of hate? Uh, I'll tell you how. They knew the letter. They knew the words of God, but they had not yet heard the Word of God. Uh, and I guess what I would ask is, don't let that happen to you. Don't let it happen to you and me. Now, how do we know? How do we know? It always comes down to one thing. And I talk about this often enough. It all comes down to one thing. 1 Corinthians 13, Paul says to us, listen to this, if I have prophetic powers, if I understand all mysteries and all knowledge, if I have all knowledge, I can know the Bible inside and out, I can quote it inside and out. But if I have not what? Love. Then I have nothing, Paul tells us. And so it all comes down to love. And by the way, I, I mentioned earlier, how do you know if they're good teachers? Same answer. It all comes down to what? Love. So the Word of God is living and active, the writer of Hebrews tells us. Uh, and listen, God can and does speak to us through the pages of this book. I've experienced it. I know you all have too. Uh, but in your study of it, in your reading of it, involve good teachers and companions. Be, be involved in the conversation. Ask your questions. Don't be afraid of them. Look for the good news. Look for it. Uh, and seek the Word of God in the words of God. And if you do, you will be blessed. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Will you pray with me? Lord God, we thank you for the gift of the Scriptures and for the ways that they do speak into our hearts and our lives. Uh, Lord, help us to engage them, to study them, to never stop seeking your presence in this holy book. And it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So as we conclude worship, I always want to invite you all to a few things. First of all, if there's anyone here who's looking for a church home to be a part of, I would uh, encourage you and invite you to consider making First Methodist that church home. Uh, we have a gathering called Believe and Belong. It's for people who want to become members of the church. Uh, and we talk about what does it mean to believe in Jesus and what does it mean to belong to a community of faith. 
uh, in a way that changes us and transforms the community around us. And uh, you can find out more information about that in your bulletin. Also want to make sure you know we do have a resource table. Uh, it's outside this door to my left and just to the bottom of the stairs. And there are several excellent books there, some on basic Christian teaching. Some of the authors I mentioned are there. There's some James Bryan Smith books there. Uh, the Adam Hamilton Making Sense of the Bible book is there. There's also some basics on uh, Methodism and, and United Methodist theology, if you're interested in that. And, and again, I've had a couple people say to me, you know, they think people are nervous about, it's, they're real books. These aren't pamphlets. Uh, please take one of the real books if it interests you. Uh, it's one of, the, one of the great blessings, I think, that we can give you as, you as you go into the week. So I invite you now to stand as we sing our closing hymn together. filled with fear and doubt, and that often looks to the letter of the law. Go now as the letter of love, sharing the hope that comes through life in Jesus Christ. Go with the blessings of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.